Good morning, everyone, and happy Monday. Hello to Stephanie H. and Francisco in chat, and welcome everyone to our 10th episode of More to Explore, where we like to keep you updated with everything happening on the world's largest live nature network. This week, we have a brand new raccoon den cam that we'll take a look at, and afterwards, we have a special behind the scenes tales from the field for the frying pan shark cam. And of course, we have a lot of news on this week's Egg Watch segment. And each week, Mike and I like to share the cams that we're looking forward to watching this week. And we'd like to know what you're watching this week. So let us know in the comments and we'll share them later in the show. And if you don't know me, my name is Brian Bird and I will be your technical director today, pushing all the buttons behind the scenes. And to teach us about the wildlife we see today is our resident naturalist, Mike Fitz. Mike, thanks again for being here. And can you believe it's our 10th episode? Hey Brian, glad to be here. And yeah, it's it's um it's I'm glad that we're uh, we're doing our our tenth episode. We haven't been canceled yet, and I actually <laughs> I'm thankful that I haven't been kicked off Explore.org yet. So thanks to everybody who supports me and the organization. But more importantly, good afternoon to everybody who's watching. Uh, good morning to you. Good evening, no matter where you happen to be around the world. If you're new to Explore.org, welcome to the community. And if you are a longtime watcher, welcome back. As Brian said, we're the world's largest live nature cam network. We have more than 180 live cameras all over the world. And this is a live show. So Brian and I are here to highlight a bunch of different things uh, over the past week and look forward to stuff that we're going to see next week. But if you have questions or comments for us, please drop those in the chats. We'll be looking for them during the broadcast today. And we also want to know about the cams that you've been watching in the past week or are looking forward to watching this week. So you can drop those in the comments too. Like Brian said, right at the top, we have a new raccoon uh, den cam to highlight today. And that's what we're looking at right now. Uh, this camera provides a remarkable view of a mother raccoon and her newborn kits. Mother took up residence in a box installed in Southeast Texas. It was installed by uh, our webcam partners at Texas Backyard Wildlife. But the box was installed, I think, originally for owls, according to our, our webcam partners. And there, uh, a squirrel made its residence in there and then a raccoon. So raccoons are adaptable critters. And we'll find that um, you know natural dens and artificial dens are quite uh, sought after by them. There's two kits in, um, in the den. They were born here on May 3rd, uh, after a gestation of about 60 or 65 days or so. They're born altricial. So that's like a newborn songbird. They're, they're blind, they're helpless for about two weeks. Uh, and we may not see them leave the den until they are a few weeks old. Through care, careful observation though, we'll be able to see them grow day by day. At birth, they weighed only a few ounces at most. Yet by the time they leave the den, they might weigh a couple of pounds or so. And raccoon moms, they're devoted parents, they're, they're patient parents. Just over the last few days, we've seen her dote over her young, grooming them often and letting them suckle milk on demand. The family will likely stay together through the entire summer, even after they leave uh, the den uh, in a few weeks' time. Kits, they might disperse in the fall, although in some areas they can remain together in a den through their first winter. However, I'm unsure if the relatively mild winters in Southeast Texas increase the likelihood of breakup in, family, uh, in raccoon families. It seems like it should, just because if, when you have the right climate and weather conditions, uh, it can sometimes speed up those major life events in the frequency of them. There's, of course, a lot we don't know about the social life of raccoons, and we might be able to discern greater details about that by watching the relationship between individual raccoons on these cameras. And if raccoons are anything, they're adaptable and they're opportunistic. I've found raccoons to be fascinating animals ever since I watched them raid campsites for unsecured food when I was a kid camping in Pennsylvania. And they're equally at home in wild and urban areas. So when the kits, they leave the dens, they'll experience a whole new world of learning and exploration. It'll be a dangerous time for them too. And that'll put their intelligence and adaptability to the test. Until then, we can enjoy the attention and devotion of this raccoon mom. Brian, I'm eager to watch this family over the next several weeks. 
But of course, we've got a lot to share with everyone during the show today. So what's uh, what's next in store? Definitely, we have a full show today. And because last week we got a view of the newly upgraded frying pan shark cams. And so we got all great, all the great behind the scenes footage. And Mike, you got to interview our manager of field operations to see what it takes to make these views possible. So Mike and Joe will tell the tale in this week's Tales from the Field. Located about 30 miles off the coast of Cape Fear, North Carolina is the Frying Pan Tower that hosts some of the most unique webcams on Explore.org. We see sharks, barracuda, dozens of other species of fish under the water. Above the water, we watch the tranquility of the Atlantic Ocean, and sometimes it's awe-inspiring power when a hurricane blows through. So recently, Explore.org's manager of field operations, Joe Pfeiffer, traveled the Frying Pan Tower to upgrade the cameras there and reconnect them to the world. And I spoke with Joe to help us learn more about that adventure. Joe, thanks for joining us again. Good to speak with you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. So I understand that this is, you know, one of the, the most remote live cam setups that we have on Explore.org. So the first question I have for you is what is the journey like to get to the tower? Sure. So it's, um, you've got two options to get out there. You can either, um, take a helicopter or you can take a boat. So I've been out there two times, once in 2019 and then our most recent trip in 2023. So for this trip, the helicopter um, just simply wasn't in operation. So we took a boat out there. Um, the boat ride, we leave from Southport, um, North Carolina, and it's about 30 miles long. So it takes, you know, depending on conditions, somewhere around the two hour mark. And then once you, once you arrive um, to the tower, then it's a matter of, uh, okay, well, how do you get onto the tower now? Basically, Richard Neal, who owns the tower, lowers a swing that's connected to a hoist, and you jump from the boat onto the swing, and then he hoists you up onto the tower. And that's how all of our gear is hoisted up into these, you know, they've got these big hoist bags that you get to and each one of them is systematically just raised and he's got a whole crew there that kind of scrambles to pull it off the hoist everything out of the way and makes preparations for the next person who um who's going to be hoisted up so it's a very um intense uh operation you know depending on conditions if the water's calm it's it's nice but if it's uh just a little bit choppy you know, there's always that uh, chance that you make one misstep and you're suddenly swimming with the sharks. Yeah, it seems like kind of a wild experience just to get onto the tower. And of course, once you're there, you got all this equipment and the cameras are under the water themselves. So what sort of special circumstances did you and your crew have to consider to install the cameras and get them to work on the frying pan tower themselves and then install them underneath the water with the fish? So for this one, um, you know, the biggest special circumstances is, is the diving factor. You know, I personally am not a diver, so I take with me Mark Muller, who is a, an expert diver. That is by far the biggest circumstance. And then basically all the, all the work that is done as far as the physical installation of the camera um, underwater, what we have to do is while we're up on the tower, we plan it out in extreme detail. We'll run through the plan multiple times. Um, Richard and, and Mark, you know, they're the divers. So, so we literally go through every single movement they're going to make, uh, make sure that they're both on the same page, just because once they're under the water and they're dealing with the cameras and the cabling, there isn't really a chance to communicate in an effective way. If say, I don't know, some, you have to change something. So, you know, we'll go through um, literally each movement and then we'll go through the scenarios. Okay, if this happens, this is what you're gonna do and this is how you're gonna communicate it, you know, between the two of you. Um, there's that, there's also the, the communication with um, the hoist operator as far as, um, you know, we lower the camera assembly down into the water and then we lower the diver into the water and there's a, there's a piece of communication that has to happen once that diver has the camera disconnected from the hoist, 
the hoist operator has to know, okay, now it's time to raise the hoist back up to um, reconnect, say, the dive seat or whatever. And that's very simple. That's just like a little floaty thing that they 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 release and it floats to the top and it's fluorescent orange. And once you see that, that means he's all clear. Um, but those little things are very important to make sure that everybody understands um, the, the, the overall safety um, operation there is just very, very important. More, I would say, than any other location. It's just dealing with diving, dealing with the currents. Um, you know, there's safety ropes that we have. There's a dive flag that we have to lower to notify all of the other boats in the area that we have divers in the water. Um, then there's actually, there's a dive boat itself. Um, typically that's in the water just in case of something, you know, just in case something happens and there's a boat there to, for the divers to get to. Um, so just coordinating all of that is just, it's a, you know, it's, it's a lot to coordinate. There's a lot of people involved. Um, I'd say th those are definitely the, the biggest special circumstances for this particular location. Yeah, it sounds kind of intense in, in that way, because, it, you know, when you're installing a camera on the land, you know, uh, you, it, you can still breathe. <laughs> if you're doing stuff under the water, you can't breathe when something goes wrong. So there's that aspect of it. And I know some of our, our audience is going to be curious about sharks uh, it, because, you know, with their sharks all through the water there, you showed me some videos, you know, taken from the top of the tower. Uh, you can see sharks in the water and we see sharks consistently on the underwater cameras. So was there anything that maybe Mark did or, or, or Richard uh, did or does to kind of reduce the risks of, of swimming with sharks? Um, I don't think so. I think it's just a, you know, it's just a, um, it's just something that, that you're swimming with. Um, you know, I avoid it by simply not being a diver. Um, that works best for me. Um, you know, these guys, you know, they're experienced divers and, and from my understanding of it, and I'm by no means an expert, but the, the sharks seem to just kind of stay to themselves and they're just there along with all the other fish and the divers are just yet another um, kind of thing in the water that they're ignoring. Um, you know, I, I, my, my theory is, you know, that just the size of the people and once, once they have all this dive gear on, they're, they're rather large. So I'm assuming that they're probably looked at as essentially another shark. Um, but, you know, that question definitely Mark or Richard could probably elaborate on as far as um, if, if there's anything special they do, um, but not, not from my observations. Yeah, maybe we'll have the opportunity to ask them at a future point in time about that. Uh, but, you know, media, uh, I guess, representations of sharks makes them look you know, like these insatiable, bloodthirsty killers that anytime something moves in the water, they're going to go after. And that's certainly not the case. There's risk involved. They're big predators, of course, but you can, I think, mitigate the risks by, you know, going into the water certain times of the day or perhaps even um, moving in, in certain ways. So you're reducing the chances that you're going to attract their attention. It's like, um, you know, in, when I go to Alaska and Katmai, you know, I, I wouldn't be going there if I thought a bear was going to attack me. Right there, it's risky um, in in a certain sense, but at the same time, there's ways that you can reduce that risk. So, uh, interesting sure. stuff there. But of course, uh, the work's not done. Um, you know, once you get the cameras installed, uh, given that the frying pan tower and the webcams there are so far out in the Atlantic, how do you connect them to the internet? Sure. So. Um... Richard has been able to secure a spot on a very high uh, radio tower that's on the mainland. Um, and the, the height of this tower is about 1,750 feet, which is really, really high. Um, we have a giant radio dish out there that's about, I think, four and a half feet in diameter. And we have another uh, one of those dishes on the frying pan tower. The... So we use a wireless point-to-point -point link, just like we do in our locations. Um, 
the unique thing about this one is the overall length of it is about 60 miles because the tower is about 30 miles inland. So this is by far the longest point to point uh, bridge that we have on and at any of our sites um, throughout Explore. Um, and the reason you know that we we have to be so high on the mainland is to you know at that distance then you have got the curvature of the earth that comes into play and you literally have to get above that um on this tower at the base of the tower there's a there's a data center and richard has ran um, fiber about 1400 feet up this tower and into a network switch that we have at the at this 1400 foot level so that and then our internet circuit we have a broadband internet circuit that's located in this data center and um overall the speeds you know on average that we get at the tower itself is about 80 megs up and 80 megs down which is really really good for that type of connection so that's that's made a really huge difference in the overall stability of this location well, that's you know this has been fascinating to to learn about this process and, and more about the location it certainly helped me to gain to gain i think a better appreciation of the cameras at the frying pan tower uh, but one final question for you joe is uh, what's the next adventure on your itinerary for explore.org well um right now i'm well yesterday i shipped um nine boxes up to Anchorage to be shipped over to King Salmon. Um, that's all the brown bear gear. Um, so that's that's right now I'm gearing up for the brown bears to bring that system back online and do some upgrades. And that's as much as I'll say for now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, no spoilers here, uh, but we are looking forward to it. Uh, Joe, thanks for uh, taking the time out of your day to talk with us. Uh, great to speak with you again. Thanks for having me again, Mike. The webcams on the Frying Pan Tower are brought to you by Explorer's partnership with the Frying Pan Tower, and that's a nonprofit that works to restore and maintain that decommissioned U.S. Coast Guard light station. They also work with researchers to study the marine life of the area, and you can find out more about it at fptower.org. All right, and moving right along, there's always so much more to see on explore.org, and we only have so much time for this show. So we'd like to do a new, just quick speed round, rapid fire list of highlights to show you some of the best clips that happened this week. Right, yeah, first up is uh, bison calving. This is at Grasslands National Park in uh, Saskatchewan, uh, Canada. Uh, and Brian, I don't know if you know this or not, but if you go to Yellowstone uh, in May, one of the most uh, infamous questions that rangers get at this time of the year are what is the little red dogs? And people are actually referring to the bison calves because you've know, never <laughs> seen one before. And they look very different from um, from their mothers. So the little red dogs are a little bison. And we get to see that at Grasslands National Park. Uh, lots of things, of course, like you said, Brian, going on. So uh, next up, beluga whales in Naknek River. We were seeing a bunch of those uh, from time to time last week, definitely a sign of spring in the Alaska Peninsula, the upper Alaska Peninsula area and the Katmai region. We might still have a few opportunities to see some of those later this week, although we're really kind of at the tail end of the beluga season now. Uh, but but keep an eye on the on that camera to see them coming up river. And then uh, we have puppies, of course, on Explore.org, and that's always wonderful to watch. This is uh, Puppies at the Educated Canines Assisting with Disabilities uh, Center. Uh, the acronym for that is just ECAD. Uh, so these are future service dogs that we have the opportunity to watch. And then in Africa at the Gorilla Rehabilitation and Conservation Education Center with our gorillas there. Uh, little Lulingu, uh, the youngest member of this group, chest beating. And uh, sometimes I, <laughs> I wonder if she'd seen um, the silverback in this group, Kioma, doing that enough times. And she's like, look at that big goof. This is what he actually uh, looks like. So great cameras there. Uh, in Panama at the fruit feeder, uh, a common basilisk lizard. This 
Brian looks to me like one of the lizards they would have used as a stand-in for dinosaurs in some 50s B movie. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, um, and a uh, little bit of a banana on its face there. Um, these, I think this genus of lizards actually has ability to, to run across the surface of water. So you may have wow. seen uh, footage of that in like nature shows from time to time. So yeah, cool little lizard visiting uh, the fruit feeder there with a lot of uh, tropical birds. And if you're ever like, really having a bad day, uh, go, to the, go to the panda cams on Explore and just watch <laughs> the pandas do their thing. I've done that before. I've just needed something <laughs> just to get my mind off of things. And the panda cams are one of the best uh, cameras to do that with our partners in China. Uh, and uh, of course, lots of underwater cameras. Uh, we talked about you know the frying pan tower cams, but also in Honduras at Utopia Village. We got um, tropical fish galore, including these blue, beautiful blue tangs. So wonderful uh, to see. Really relaxing cam there. In Africa, a couple of Africa, a couple more African clips that we'll look at. So this is in um, Impala in Kenya with our partners there. This is a Nubian woodpecker. Uh, maybe looking for some ants or looking for uh, some termites. Hopefully that that um post is not infested with them because i think that does help to support some of the camera infrastructure there i guess we'll find out in the future uh and then you know one of the most wonderful things that you can see uh is close-up views of large mammals uh on the cameras in africa so at rosie's pan with our africam partners looking at this beautiful leopard lapping up water and finally going back to uh, central america this time to costa rica with sloths uh, with the Toucan Rescue Ranch. So they rehabilitate rescued sloths and a few other animals to rewild them in the forest of Costa Rica. So yeah, tons to see on Exploited Org. It's far too much for me to keep up with, Brian. I don't know if you're able to keep up with it, but I certainly no, can. It's always difficult, but always one of the greatest things that helps all of us at Exploited Org keep up with everything is seeing the viewer snapshots. And it's uh, the best way that we can pull these great highlights for everyone to see. But moving on, we have a lot of new news on all of our nests. So that brings us to this week's Egg Watch. We're changing up Egg Watch a little bit this week uh, because there's so much going on. So this uh, first part of it, we're just going to focus on unhatched eggs. Right now um, in Africa, in South Africa, the black eagles there are still incubating two eggs. And we may have a hatch sometime during the first week of June. So look for that. Uh, in Montana, at the Canada Goose Nest that we've been watching, unfortunately, that camera is currently offline, but the hatch is expected any day now. So maybe today, maybe tomorrow, uh, we're working with our partners at the Owl Research Institute to get that camera back online. So hopefully we can see the, the baby goslings leave the nest in a few days time. Uh, in Minnesota at the Great Spirit Bluff Peregrine Falcons, those four eggs are hatching right now. At least one of the eggs had a pip on it this morning. And if you're unfamiliar with that term pip, that's basically just a little hole that the baby bird uh, pokes uh, through in the egg. So that's a sign that it's starting to hatch. So over the next couple of days or so, I think we're going to be able to watch those eggs hatching. So head over there right now, if you want to see that action in, uh, in Maryland at the Chesapeake Osprey nest, we got a lot of Osprey, um, on egg watch this week, which we didn't have before. So first egg, uh, for Audrey and her new partner, who's nicknamed Tom, just like the old, <laughs> the old, uh, partner there, uh, first egg, First egg was laid in this nest on May 1 and the second egg on May 4. In Montana at uh, Charlo, the osprey nest there, Charlotte and Charlie have two eggs. First egg was laid on May 6 and the second one on May 9. In Maine at the Audubon Boathouse, uh, Skiff and Dory, they actually have two eggs as well. And this is new as of uh, this past week. So first egg came on May 2nd, and the second egg was a little bit delayed, but and that one came on May 7th. Uh, they, they, with the Osprey too, they're not done yet. They could have more eggs in their clutches. Female 
Osprey's lay one to four eggs per clutch, and three is the most common. So with our nests only having two right now, the nests that we're watching, we could have a third egg or more in the uh, in these nests uh, coming up within a few days. On to uh, the second part of egg watch, though, Brian, and that's uh, a lot of chicks. These are birds that have already hatched. So with the eagles that we've been watching in Decorah, Iowa, one eaglet still there with um, hatchery mom and hatchery dad. Uh, we can maybe expect to see this this bird fledge in the middle of June. Then, on th off the coast of California, at the two harbors, eagles and a single eaglet still uh, still in that nest there, uh, and also as an expected fledge for that in the middle of June, maybe early June or late or middle of June. Going back to uh, the East Coast now to Baltimore, Maryland. In downtown Baltimore with the peregrine falcons, uh, four eggs hatched there. Uh, the ISs, uh, they're going to stay in the nest for about 40 days or so. They hatched um, in late April. So we still have a while to enjoy them growing. And then new news with the great blue herons um, on the eastern shore of Maryland. This is uh, just to the west of Ocean City, Maryland. There's at least three chicks spotted in the nest. It's been really hard to see because um, we can't see down into the nest cup, but we're getting to see more and more bobbleheads popping up from time to time as the parents bring food deliveries there. Uh, so they uh, they don't hatch at the same time. It's asynchronous hatching with great blue herons, and they're going to stay in the nest for seven to eight weeks. On average, we could see them uh, fledge in late June. So yeah, if you're into birds, this is a great time to be watching explore.org. Awesome. So much happening. And the best way to capture all of these is with a snapshot, which we have a, our weekly photo contest called Fan Cam Friday. And let's take a look at this week's winners. Congratulations to this week's winners. If you would like to participate in Fan Cam Friday, all you need to do is take a snapshot by clicking the camera icon above any live cam and then save it to the gallery. Be sure to help us find future winners by favoriting snapshots. And coming up this week, as far as other live shows, of course, you can catch more to explore every Monday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific. But later on this week, tomorrow, Tuesday at 7 a.m. Pacific, we have the AfriCam show, which you get to get go on a virtual live safari from the comfort of your home. And coming up on Thursday, we have another episode of Wild Moments, which is specifically all of the highlights from all of the AfriCam cameras. And Mike, uh, what cameras are you looking forward to watching this week? Well, I, I've been gravitating recently to the raccoon kits, so I think I might be doing that a lot uh this this week so i think that that'll be that'll be fun to watch over the over the next week or so and more as they uh as those kits get bigger and uh they start to explore that little den space very cool this week uh, i actually caught this clip just this morning uh the care for the wild outdoor rhino cams these rescued and protected rhinos just two of them out here just having the time of their life just playing chasing each other around is incredibly adorable and I'm looking forward to watching it all week. Um, and as we asked for before earlier in the show, we want to know what you're watching. 
And we have some submissions here. So thank you, Stephanie H. Saying, I'm always looking for the elephants, which you found on the Rosie's Pan camera last night. And that was also the same camera where we saw that, that leopard drinking highlight as well. Betty's mom, I've been fascinated by Byron both uh, with all the little peregrine falcon chicks along with the raccoons. Thank you, Donna, watching the Texas Backyard Wildlife. Newbie to the webcams, welcome to explore. There's so much to watch and happy to have you. Gray Facts. Hello, Gray Facts. Uh, been watching Ariana Hummingbird. Totally love the new rac raccoon cam and also the goose cam at Roger's Place. Olivia B. Watching the osprey lay eggs and incubate them. Six eggs among the nests and hoping for more. So are we. Nature Girl, I have been watching raccoon cam belugas on that neck river at the University of Alaska Fairbanks cams. Awesome. And also be able to check out the muskox and the northern lights cameras at the University of Fairbanks as well. And Laura, I cannot stop watching the new Texas Backyard Wildlife Cam, especially at night when there's so many animals pass by, right? It's, it's so incredible that we get these cameras 24 hours a day and the, rac the raccoon den cam, especially having these multiple cameras in the same view, can actually see what's going on around them. And if you ha are not already, here's where you can find us on all your favorite social media platforms to give us, uh, if you would like to follow us there. And on YouTube, including our latest video, which if you just need some help relaxing, then we have 20 minutes of sleeping puppies. And Mike, we have a new segment that we're looking for doing next week. That's right. Yeah. Uh, next week, I'll be sharing a story about something I've been observing in my neighborhood. And I want to encourage you to observe nature beyond the webcams on explore.org. We don't want you to stop watching the webcams on Explore, but you know, even in the densest of cities, you're surrounded by organisms doing some remarkable things. And sometimes it's right inside of your, right inside of your home. So if you have that opportunity, uh, take a look and see what you can find. Um, and hopefully you'll have a, a story to share with us next week because I am, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, a little bit about the nature in my local community. Very cool. And also, we want to do a new segment next week of promoting everyone. We want to call it the, the mug shots. <laughs> so I don't know if, if you may not know, every week we have our Fan Cam Friday contest. And if you win, you actually get to win an Explore mug with your snapshot on it. So I know there's a whole lot of those floating around out there, and we would love to see them. So take a snap of your mug shots and send them to feedback at explore.org. And Mike, if people want to get even more involved with Explore, how can they do that? Right, we couldn't couldn't function here at Explore.org without our volunteers or volunteer camera operators and moderators. So if you're interested in becoming a volunteer for us, go to explore.org slash volunteer, fill out the form, we'll get back to you with more information. We're also looking specifically for moderators for the bear cams in Katmai National Park this summer. So if you have an interest in that, you can go to uh, this link right here. We'll drop that in the chat as well. If you uh, can't type it in fast enough before we, we go, uh, we, we move on to our conclusion here. But thanks to all of our volunteers and camera operators and, and moderators who, who work so hard to, to help our website run so well. Definitely. And thanks again. For, to everyone for watching. That is all the time we have for this week. Um, I want to give, again, another special thank you for all of our moderators, camera operators, and of course, you, Mike Fitz, for teaching us all about the wildlife that we see. And in honor of Cam Up, Cat, we'll end today's show on one of her favorite cams. And we'll see you again next week with more to explore. And until then, have a great week and happy exploring. <laughs>